us. But right now, he probably needs no introduction. He is a former senator. He served for the longest time of any Republican senator from Minnesota in the United States Senate from 1978 to 1995. He is Dave Durenberger, and he's here now. We're going to talk politics. We're also going to let you know about his new book, When Republicans Were Progressive. Senator Durenberger, welcome. Thank you. That is kind of a provocative title, When Republicans Were Progressive. What do you mean by that? That um, we we have a tradition of being a Republican state, which nobody knows anything about because of Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale and Gene McCarthy, but... It, it is our tradition, and from the end of the dep- or the middle of the depression to about well, actually to Jesse Ventura's election, we were all progressives, and uh, our party was a progressive party, not in the sense of today, but in the traditional sense. You can go back to Teddy Roosevelt, or you can go back to Harold Stassen and Elmer Anderson and Harold Vander, the man I worked with, and a whole a whole group of people that. Minnesotans know pretty well. Senator Durnberger, when you say that term pro- progressive, what does it mean to you? Um, it, you know, it means people who've dedicated a portion of their lives to serving others. It's, it's about that simple and that they've had the background or the experience with others to do that in a, um, in a, in a community service area, um, normally with some politics in it. And it can be a Republican or a Democrat. And in fact, in Minnesota, in the 60 years that, that I describe in the book, uh, including my three terms in the United States Senate, um, it, these were people who were a success at something else in their life who chose to spend a part of their time. I served only three terms. and Which was a nice length of time. Terms. That was a nice duration, three yeah. terms. Yes, it was a, one, and it was a wonderful time because it was from – you know, from Jimmy Carter to, through Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. So you to, had to work with different administrations, different types of people, right. different light, types of presidents. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the neat thing was I got to serve with a lot of people just like me on the Republican side as well as on the Democratic side. And I also got to serve with people who were much more liberal and much more conservative than I. I'm talking with Senator Dave Durenberger. He served Minnesota in the United States Senate from 1978 to 1995, he had other positions of leadership, and he has really become a statesman from our country, from our state. You, too, can talk with him, 651 or 866-989-9226. This person, person texts, this senator is a good guy. He's one of the last Republicans that knows what's going on. Interesting text. What I want to ask you, though, is... Where did we go wrong? Why are we living in such a partisan landscape, Senator? Yeah, unfortunately, I'll, I'll do that. Do this quickly. Um, the, um, the the Republicans in the House, in particular, led by Newt Gingrich, um, in the uh, starting with the election of Bill Clinton, took my party away from me. Took uh, our party away from Minnesota. Then it did it on purpose. And when it was successful in 1995, I mean, its goal was not to help pass health care reform, which Clinton made a priority, but to get Clinton out of office after one term. Same thing they did in Obama. And um, they were successful in getting themselves into the majority with it. So Newt started by telling people, uh, don't bother coming to Washington except a couple days a week. You know, we'll shorten your work schedule, leave your families at home. And it ended. it ended what made... Um, Washington successful, regardless of the president. It was real human relations. People got to know each other. My kids grew up with right other rapport. Kids. I mean, and, yeah. and 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 you were servants of the people. Yeah, exactly. The American people. Yeah, in a way that you would do it if you were if the capital of the United States were in St. Paul or in Minneapolis. It's a, it was the same kind of environment, and and uh, it's just like local government, like state government. The national government was just like that. You you lived where you worked. Dan is calling from Minnetonka. Hi, Dan. Hey, Rashini. And hey, Dave. Hi. Thank you for your service to our country, Mr. Or, uh, Senator Durenberger. Thank you. You know, when I hear the word progressive, it's really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, taking hostage a great word, progressive. Now it means move toward European socialism and away from the founding fathers' idea of what, of what America should be, the idea of America. And my other little point is, when, how is it that these candidates refuse to debate each other? 
They're there to serve us. They're there to ask, be asked questions. I never hear most of them, at least on the on the left side of the aisle, on WCCO, fielding questions from callers, and they're refusing to debate, including Amy Klobuchar. I never hear Tim Walls. And well, I'm going to jump in real quickly. So on my yeah. show on Sundays, I'm doing conversations with candidates. And the point of that, that's not a debate. It's each candidate. They've all been invited, all the congressional and gubernatorial candidates. We heard from two this last Sunday. We'll hear from Pete Stauber coming up this Sunday on my show. And that's so that listeners... Voters can talk with them directly. Now, on our very station, November 1st, there's two candidates for Senate. Karn Housley and Tina Smith will debate. So, Dan, I hope you do listen. But I will but let— I, I yeah. hope they show uh, up on, on air. Yeah, Dan, let, let me respond to you. I think yeah. uh, the, the, the word progressive lately has really been attributed to some of the people you just talked about. You call it socialists or whatever it is. And that's largely a media uh, event. It isn't that they, nobody created that word to apply— to the far left, because it used to apply to the middle, either right of center, left of center, and so forth. So it's whatever change has taken place really was not caused by by a change in those of us who served you as, um, you know, just right of center in my case, or just left of center in the case of, of somebody else. So, and and the, the current, you know, the, the current situation, of course, is so dominated by, by um, money and negative, I mean, I had I had Roger Ailes advise my campaign three times, and that was a that was a very moderate Roger Ailes in those days. In, in those days, so in he those changed days. over but time. Today also. it's it's going down your alley and and picking out your garbage and and your recyclable crap out and and throwing it back at you, or creating creating stuff that isn't even in the garbage. Well, can. and we'll get into there was an attack on a couple of different Republican candidates. Uh, on the campaign trail. We'll get into that, but lots of calls coming in for Senator Dave Durenberger. You too can speak with him directly, 651 or 866-989-9226. Richard calling from Minneapolis. Hi, Richard. Hi, uh, Senator Durenberger. Yeah, I met you years ago uh, back in uh, New Ulm, uh, a um, meeting for uh, Jim Hagedorn. But the question I want to ask you is if you could Watch this thing on YouTube that says 10 things big corporations don't want you to know about them. One of them was Bayer uh, had this uh, vaccine that it gave to hemophiliacs, and but it didn't wasn't test for HIV. It killed a lot of people uh, back in those days. I think it killed uh, Arthur Ashe. But the uh, question I want to ask is, do you think the corporations – are too big these days, and they're not national. They're mainly multinational. They have no allegiance to our country. Yeah, I don't. I don't think uh, it, in a corporate environment you start out with, uh, you know, your principal job being being a, a particular allegiance. In the in the world we live in today, you know, you you can read about, you know, the globe changes all of the time. We're in we're in world markets. We're influenced by world events. We're influenced by a whole big finance industry that that didn't exist a few years ago when I was in office. I mean, there's a huge amount of people whose financial futures, their their billionaire status, is pegged to how well a company does in this market, that market, or whatever. And and um, so it, it's really hard to be critical of it because it is what it is, and it, it, there's no way government's going to change it, even though it tries, as as the current president tells you, in uh, to get trade policy and that that by that means trying to break, make some sense to it. And I give uh, some, you know, I'm pointing some shade or putting some shade on, you know, even media companies that do news, that are supposed to do news, the conglomeratization of those make them less independent voices, more beholden to stockholders, shareholders. And that's not good for tr- good news, right? And for the First Amendment, it is not good. We do have to take a real quick break and then more calls because all the calls are coming in for former senator, but definite statesman of all time, Dave Durenberger. He's in studio. You can call us 651 989 9226. All right, we're continuing our conversation with former Republican senator, still a Republican, former senator of the United States Senate from the state of Minnesota, Dave Durenberger. He's in studio with us. Many calls and texts coming in for you. And you can call, too, and talk with him directly in our remaining few minutes, 651-989-9226 or 866-989-9226. Paul is calling from White Bear. Hi, Paul. Hey, good morning, um, Rishini and uh, Senator Durenberger. Good morning. Um, I just want to say, Dave, it's an honor to be able to speak with you. Um, 
I grew up um, in the Reagan era as a kid, and it's when I kind of formed my own political views. Um, and uh, I just really appreciated what you and uh, Senator Bosch did, did during that period of time to to get me involved. And um, I just want to thank you for that. And then the second question, or the, that's my comment, but my question for you is, what is your take on term limits? term limits? I hear lots of people talking about it. Do you think it's ever possible? And if it were possible, do you think it's a good idea? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, thanks for your comment about that period of time uh, that you got introduced to, because that's that was really my introduction to serving with somebody like Ronald Reagan and George Bush and and um, and the, the men and women who made the Senate and the House and the, and the country what it was today. Uh, I started out being a term limits person. Um, I served with people that were invaluable, and I thought, oh, my God, if, if these people disappear after, you know, two terms in office, look look what we've lost, look what the country's lost, and so forth. And now, of course, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the pits, you know, of people who serve their interests more than they serve your interests. Uh, and uh, so this is, it looks attractive. You know, let's get them out of there as quick as we can, change the, you know, it'll change everything. I'm not sure it will. I think... Uh, we rank, in the book, we write about ranked choice voting as a preferable way of going about it. Let's let's give more people an opportunity to get on the ballot. Well, here's my question, because I am pro-term limits. I think your number, three terms, that was a good number. You know, 18 years. It's like, think about any companies or, you know, I've been a broadcaster for 22 years. Different yep. stations, though, different places yep. over those years. So I I just get very frustrated with some of the more senior people in our Congress right now, Senator Durenberger. Nope. They don't have the heart, in my mind, I don't know them personally, they don't have the heart that you do. And, I mean, Pelosi, Grassley, I think some of these people need to get the heck out of our Congress. No, and I, that's just exactly what I said, Roshania, that <laughs> right now, when they aren't producing anything other than noise, <laughs> you say, let's get them right. out of there and either go back or invent a new future. And, and Yeah, I mean, people. like, thanks so, for your service. End on a high note. Yeah. Go have fun with your grandkids. Maybe it, help yeah. create it a means to an end. succession right. planning. The yeah. next decades of yeah. leaders, they can help mentor, yeah. right? So to sure. me, it seems like a power grab. They're just holding on to that power, Senator. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got lots of texts and (laughs) and, uh, calls coming in for you. Another person mentioning how they grew up during the time that you and Senator Boschwitz were in office at the same time or, you know, working together and um, meeting you and, you know, the kinds of things that you did. When I think about what I wanted to ask you today, it's especially what would be your lesson to today's members of the Minnesota legislature and the U.S. Congress on compromise. Yeah, you bet. Uh, the, here's where it starts. <laughs> uh, sit down with each other and try to figure out what the problem is before you come up with a solution. Uh, don't come to don't don't come to uh, your legislative service with all the answers because you haven't got all the answers until you've sat and listened to people who have a different point of view. They come from a different part of the state. They come from a different background and philosophy. They come from a different church environment. Whatever the case may be, <laughs> and. And uh, the genius of making the system work well is to define the problem in ways that both sides can understand what the problem is. And then you can bring your more conservative view of government or your more liberal view of government to bear on solving it. And that's what good legislators accomplish. All right. This person says, uh, Senator, you should run again. We miss you. That's really terrific. <laughs> Tell this person, please, I'm 84 years old. Um, but what he'd rather do is that you buy his book when Republicans were progressive, and you can carry him around all the time then. You don't have to miss you much, right? Sold on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to start using that one. <laughs> buy my book. The Pocket Dave, yeah. Um, this person says the incumbent Democratic candidates are refusing to debate their opponents. Where is Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith? Why isn't Walls on WC? CCO. Well, here's the thing. On November 1st, Tina Smith and Karen Housley are debating on our very air. Right. You're going to hear about it for days now. It's coming up November 1st. I've invited all the candidates on my show on Sundays, News and Views with Rashini Rajkumar. Many are coming on. And if you haven't heard one of yours on Sunday between 12 and 3, get after them, have them come on. Sometimes debate is the proper scenario. Sometimes I like to just give an individual candidate the opportunity right. to be questioned directly by people. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing you got a lot of questions in your time. Yeah, and and I've had a lot of debates in my time. And and the, the genius of the debate is um, y- you don't get to 
to repeat your uh, ads, your commercials. <laughs> you, know, you, you have you to actually to have somebody give plain say, talk. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yes, you say that now, but when you were, you know, last year when you were voting on it, what about that? And then let them try to distinguish it or something like that. The, the, the big part of this, this, uh, the, the debate business is the, the media, principally the televised, television media, is making a huge amount of money off of these lousy, but what they think, are. Lousy. Many of them are lousy ads. Yeah, exactly. And my my friend Jack Danforth, who was a.